I am um, Elise Betts, and I am, I'm in the Alumni Relations Office, and um, part of my job, um, which is somewhat unusual for an Alumni Relations Officer, is working with current students. So in 2004, I founded the Penn Traditions Program, which is a student program in Development Alumni Relations Office, where we help students to feel like they're part of this community for life. So um, for all of you who are sitting here, um, I know you have the the stress and worries of student life, um, but in 50 years, when you come back for your 50th reunion, you will still be a part of the Penn alumni family, the Penn community, and you'll probably be feeling uh, less stress at that point in your life. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the introductions. You all have a piece of paper in front of you that has the short bios of our students. Um, I want to get right into um, the question and answers. And then because it's a small group, I want to open it up for some discussion after I ask some of the formal questions. So, um, Dwayne, I'm going to start with you. Um, tell, me, tell us why you chose Penn. Uh, the, the honest answer to that is actually really great for this, the reason for this panel, because um, my partner and I applied to law school together at the same time. We're from Arkansas. Um, and we were admitted to all the same law schools, which is really great. And we'd actually picked another school. And we bought the hoodies and a plane ticket, and we were set. And then we came to Penn for Admitted Students Weekend. Um, and people tell you when you're searching for law school that you're going to find a good fit. And you don't really know what that means, right? You say, oh, you'll, you'll feel it when you get there, wherever this fit might be. So we came to Philadelphia, it was our first time here, and we visited Penn Law School, and we felt it for the first time. And I remember that we were just looking at each other on the L, and we said, are we gonna go to Penn? Because <laughs> it had never occurred to us that we would be here. Um, but there was something about um, just the way that there was such a community at Penn Law School, uh, the Dean of Students, Dean Clinton, was at my partner's table, and we just thought it was remarkable that this openly gay man was the Dean of Students, and everybody just loved him. Um, and the president of Lambda Law at that time was this really great, friendly, outgoing person. And so a lot of it was just that we felt like we could really be a part of a community here. Um, and coming from Arkansas, where there you know, aren't too many uh, communities for LGBT people to be a part of. You know, it's a community of three, but then two of us left. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that was really something that we were looking for that the culture at the other law school just didn't have. They, they, we would ask, you know, well, do you guys have a Lambda group? And they said, I think so, which wasn't a very comforting answer uh, for us because um, we, we, th we thought it was really important. Um, so that's how, that's how we ended up here. Thanks, Dwayne. Kristen. Okay, um, so I actually, when I started the college process, I was pretty much hell-bent on going to Harvard. I guess all my life, I just, I don't know what drove it, I just wanted to go to Harvard. Um, and one morning, we, well, one weekend we got like a card from Penn saying there was a conference that weekend for diverse students and you should come up. And I was saying, oh, I don't think I'm going to go. My dad woke me up at like 5 o'clock in the morning. We drove all the way here, slept the whole way, went to the conference, and I don't know, there was just something about it. It just seemed, there were so many different student groups, there was so much energy when you walk down Locust Walk, there's just so many people always coming at you, and it's not, you don't get that on other college campuses where you really do get this sense of energy and just, just sort of eclectic group of people. Um, then I discovered the Huntsman program, which is a dual degree program in international studies and business. Um, and I just thought, wow, I completely, you know, hit the lottery here because this is exactly what I want to do. Um, and I guess it um, speaks to the idea of community. I just really like the idea of being a part of a smaller community of people. Being on a large campus, being able to meet tons of people, but being on a smaller community, 50 students, I love the idea that 60% of the students were from other countries. Um, I was trying to increase my language skills, Spanish and Chinese, and so you know, being around people who speak those languages fluently was very helpful. So you know, it was really just the energy and the culture of the campus. Um, in addition to the academic offerings that brought me to Penn. Okay, thanks. Sura. Well, I guess uh, the ongoing trend is none of us actually planned on coming to Penn. <laughs> <laughs> we got here. Um, 
So again, I, I wasn't planning on coming to Penn. I wasn't planning on studying biology or business. I was planning on studying physics and engineering at MIT, and I was set on going there. Um, and then I, I guess the big change was a phone call from Walter Licht in the, in the history department uh, about the Civic Scholars Program, which is mentioned in the paper. Uh, and we had you know, a three hour long conversation about civic engagement, about how Penn's involved, what I could do when I came here, and this new program. Uh, and I thought that the, when I left the phone call, uh, I, I was just sort of uh, dumbfounded that uh, a tenured faculty would call me, a lowly high school student, to talk to me about what I was interested in and to see how I could better fit into the Penn community. Uh, and so that was a, a fairly powerful move. Um, and the second, the second element of that is exactly what Chris had mentioned, which is I'm not in the Huntsman program, but I'm in the Vagelos program, which is life sciences and management. Uh, and it's the same exact kind of setup where there's a smaller community uh, and, and I can integrate multiple, of my, uh, 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 multiple interests of mine uh, in, in the same curriculum. And I find that to be extremely powerful because in the research that I do and the work I do outside of school, um, integrating those skills and those knowledge sets has been invaluable. Uh, and so I, as soon as I realized that this stuff was happening and that I, I could tap into this potential, um, it was pretty clear I was coming to Penn. Thanks, Sir Brandon. You know, it's funny that you say it because um, I'm gonna go ahead and continue the trend. I, I didn't think I was gonna come to Penn either. And I actually wanted to, to go to MIT too. I was dead set on being an engineer there. And, uh, you know, uh, I, my uncle works in commercial real estate in Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, he had, you know, told me about Penn and, and how great their business school is and, and stuff like that. And so I gave it a shot and I got in. And uh, I tell you what, I, I really didn't even make my decision until I got here, or until I came for Penn previews. Um, I'm from Florida and so I was like, oh, University of Florida, it's going to be great. I'm excited to stay in the sunny weather and whatnot. But, uh, you know, after seeing this campus, I mean, it's just a beautiful campus. It's something that, you know, you just can't get many other places. And uh, I had never lived in the big city before either. I always wanted to live in a big city, so Philadelphia lends itself uh, to, to, be, to be a great choice for me, so, yeah. Okay, Lena. Um, so I always wanted to come to Penn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> um, literally, the first time I kicked in my mother's stomach was at a Dalai Lama concert over at the museum. So <laughs> it's kind of pretty much set. Um, I also went to a boarding school in McLean, Virginia, and I'm from the Bronx. So that was kind of a huge culture shock. And after going to boarding school in Virginia, definitely realized that I wanted the urban diverse setting as opposed to the homogenous setting that happens to be in Virginia. Um, so I visited Penn a number of times on college tours. Once again, um, basically what Dwayne said, I just got, I got the feeling, it was my fit. Um, I was really interested in PPE, which is philosophy, politics, and economics, and that was a huge reason why I wanted to come to Penn. Then I started that track and realized how much I hated econ, no offense. Um, <laughs> so that's not my major at all anymore. Um, but there were a lot of things, and so come November, Penn was the only school I applied to, because um, I, I pretty much was willing to put all my eggs in one basket. It paid so, off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the out-of-classroom experience. Um, the activities at Penn range from Penn astronomers to the Penn Zoroastrian Society mm -hmm. and everything in between. And, you know, I've had the occasion to talk to students who uh, would say, and we saw this last night, Stephanie, you know, there isn't a Chinese music society at Penn, so I'm going to start one. You know, or there isn't, a, you know, a Penn rock climbing group, so I'm going to start one. So uh, I know that you all have uh, multiple activities that you engage in outside of the classroom. So I want you to talk a little bit about them, um, what that is like for you, and how it contributes to your education. So Lena, why don't I start with you? So my two, my two extracurricular babies right now um, are Penn Democrats and um, my sorority, Lambda Theta Alpha Latin Sorority Incorporated. I'm on the board for Penn Democrats as their community outreach director. And basically what my committee does, we teach civics, um, nonpartisan, just straight up government, to elementary students in West Philly. So that's, that's, that's a lot, it's pretty intense. Um, there aren't many classes about government that in 
elementary schools, so it's kind of a new topic altogether. And on top of it, it's an after-school program, so they're all antsy anyways. Um, but but it's it's been really fun, and I think we're doing a lot of really great work. Um, so Penn Democrats, definitely, I've been spending a lot of time with that. I'm also vice president of my sorority. Um, we're the first uh, Latina sorority in the nation. We're actually a metro chapter between Temple and Penn. So it's nice because I get off campus a lot and get to um, just meet other people, period, over at Temple, which is really nice to go over there so much. And also my work-study job, I work for the Office of Government and Community Affairs, and that's been really rewarding. Um, it's a lot more than just sitting there. You know, any kind of government or community-related work that President Gutman gets in the mail comes to our office, so we get to do a lot of pretty cool things. We have an office in D.C., and so that's basically what I do. So before we move on, so has, has your uh, co-curricular activity um, kind of informed decision, decisions you've made about your career? Oh, definitely. I mean, have you, did you come in thinking, I'm going to be a X, and because of the things that are happening out of the classroom, you've um, made some different decisions? Um, yes, I'd say so. I wasn't really interested in, I was always interested in political science and government kind of related work, but not necessarily the communications part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm actually a communications major. And I think a lot of that actually came from Penn Democrats, doing a lot of community service work, just essentially having to hone in on my communication skills, just dealing with you know, people at the schools and trying to organize that, dealing with students, trying to get them to come out and volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, made me use a lot of skills that I haven't used before, and I actually liked it. Um, I like the field of communications. I like how you can get to certain people different ways through advertising or what have you. So I think that that shaped what I eventually want to do. Okay. Brandon. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, I'm, I, I do a bunch of stuff on campus, but a um, couple of main things. So I play rugby for Penn. Um, I just started this uh, this past year, and uh, I'm also their media chair, so I, you know, uh, do their websites and Facebook, Twitter, all that social media stuff. So, um, and uh, I'm also part of uh, Six Directions, which is the Native American student organization on campus, um, and uh, that, that's also been a very recent thing. You have to excuse me; I'm <laughs> getting over a cold. So, um, but uh, but yeah, we had our first our first annual powwow this past spring, uh, which was amazing. Had some really great um, participants in that, and um, yeah, basically, I also work for uh, for College Houses and Academic Services um, over at Stouffer Commons, and uh, I've been the NSO coordinator there the past two years. So basically, help plan all the events during NSO, um, and uh, and also do the websites too. So and uh, all these things, I I, I tell one thing. Um, that has really, like, you know, being a part of all these things is, and I'm sure we can all relate with this, is, uh, you know, just making sure that we're on top of our stuff. It, it, a lot of this is about time management and, uh, you know, being, being organized and, and being a little bit, a little bit driven is, is really important to stay on top of this stuff. So yeah. it, it's really given me a, a lot of experience, you know, getting ready for, quote unquote, the real world, I guess mm -hmm. we could. Brandon, you're being humble because any of you who have experienced the, the new, new student orientation, there are hundreds of events that are morning till late night, early morning, and Brandon is one of a, a small team that miraculously, you know, transforms this campus, and I think for first-year students and transfer students who go through it, they are, you know, first of all, completely prepared to be a Penn student, but also they make their, you know, their best friends, they meet their spouse or partner. It's, it's an, a remarkable thing, and I know you've done it for two years. Yeah, it's, it's a very important week for us because, you know, it's, we really want to be able to let the freshmen, you know, immerse into Penn's culture and Penn's campus, and, you know, giving them a multitude of social and academic events is really important for them to, to dive right in and do those things. And, um, you know, from, from sort of results stuff, it seems like we're doing a pretty good job and people are really enjoying it. So it's something I, I really, really enjoy doing. Okay, thanks. Sura? Uh, so I'll, I'll describe three of my activities on campus, uh, on and off campus, extracurricularly. Uh, but I guess the uniting theme for most of my college career has been crisis management. So I came into Penn knowing I wanted to pursue crisis management and public health management. Um, and so, I didn't exactly know how I'd go about studying that. Um, <coughs> and so I, I figured I'd make my own concentration, which I did. Uh, and as part of that, 
I guess one big section of my experience has been research. Uh, Penn is a research institution, and I've been involved in research in many capacities. So I spent the past two summers in Guatemala with the Guatemala Health Initiative uh, through Penn Medicine, uh, and I've done studies, uh, some of which will be published this year, um, on healthcare management issues in pricing uh, for ambulance services uh, and for uh, low-income healthcare. Uh, the second research project I've been involved in has been pure science research uh, at the medical school in, uh, to keep it simple, cancer and drugs. Um, a third research project I, I've been involved in is on the other side of the issue of catastrophes, which is through the Wharton angle. So I'm a Wharton student, and through the risk management, um, or through the operations, uh, the OPM department, which is operations and information management, there's a risk management research group, and I've been involved in their research on how companies respond to disasters. Um, and all of that sort of feeds into my long-standing involvement with fire and EMS. So in high school, uh, I was involved with the fire department, uh, hazmat, and ambulance corps. Uh, and at Penn, I run the, uh, the medical emergency response team, which is, uh, I guess, four years old, four and a half years old now. Uh, we provide uh, EMS services to students uh, between 5 p.m. and 7 a.m. Uh, on a nightly basis. Uh, and so this year has been a big year of change for us, uh, some of them mentioned in the paper. Um, but most notably, uh, we've increased our membership, increased funding, um, and uh, I mean, it's interesting this year there's been a, a, a massive increase in the number of incidents on campus uh, during the day as well as after, excuse me, after hours. So. That's, that's a major involvement as well. And on the side, um, I'm involved in uh, the Philadelphia Animal Welfare Society. So since freshman year, uh, I've had eight dogs and two cats. Um, <laughs> and I, I have one dog of my own as well. So it's completely unrelated, but also rehab and development of animals is a longstanding passion. And I can tell you from um, the alumni relations standpoint, Sorov and his uh, team of uh, MERT team, Med Medical Emergency Response Team, have been partners with us on essentially saving heyday, the tradition that we're all so familiar with, at minimizing um, injury and uh, you know, harm reduction. And we've uh, established a new tradition called the Final Toes for Seniors. And his team partnered with us on uh, developing a plan to make sure that students were safe. And I think, effectively, we've been able to save heyday, at least for another yeah, year. Absolutely. So, and and that's, that's significant, because there have been, um, sort of mentioned that there have been uh, increased incidents with students. And uh, the same is true of heyday, uh, you know, obviously a, a, a tradition that is very close to people's hearts, but dangerous. So he's been a great partner with us. Kristen. OK, um, so uh, since freshman year, I've been involved on the Wharton Dean's Advisory Board, which has pretty much taken up a pretty hefty chunk of my time. Um, it's great because I get to impact what I'm learning. I get to impact the curriculum. Um, I get to speak pretty regularly with the Vice Dean, uh, with some of the administration in G95 in Wharton, um, and with the Dean um, at least twice a semester. So I've worked on initiatives ranging from the Wharton Research Scholars Program, um, to improving academic integrity um, within the school, to um, fostering more class participation by international students. Um, I would say those would pretty much my three foci um, throughout uh, sort of the Wharton Dean's Advisory Board experience. Um, I also work very closely with the Writing Center here. I'm a tutor, um, uh, TA, um, and also an editor for the program. Um, and I love it because it gives me just being able to meet all these different students. A lot of them that come in are international students who struggle um, with um, writing, especially in the first year here at Penn. Um, so you get to meet a wide variety of students who are studying a wide variety of topics. Um, so it kind of takes me outside of my major to sort of learn different things. Um, and then Throughout the last couple of years, I've become increasingly interested in economic development. Uh, in my freshman year, freshman year summer, I did an internship in Botswana um, at a place called the International Financial Services Center, which is basically trying to leverage Botswana as sort of the Dubai of Africa um, in terms of just attracting capital flows in order to foster development. Uh, and that was an experience. I also did research there, um, studying the effect of HIV AIDS on business costs. Um, and that experience really just started a 
deep interest in African development. Um, so I went back to Tanzania uh, the next year and did a microfinance study there trying to figure out whether microfinance really does work, does it really impact um, the recipients' lives. Um, and then in the last two years, I've been working on Youth Bank, which is mentioned here, which is a micro-business incubator for street youth, um, street youth in Lagos. Um, and we're actually expanding throughout Nigeria now, so it's not just going to be in Lagos. But basically, we take at-risk youth um, who've been involved in activities, you know, criminal activities, drug activities, prostitution. We kind of, I, we identify some sort of promise in them, train them for a period of a month, employ them in a business that we own so they get a steady income, they get job training, and after that they write a business plan in order to say, you know, they want to be an entrepreneur, they want to start their own business, they've already had work experience. Um, and then we get a bunch of Nigerian corporates, government officials to come evaluate these um, business pitches and then ultimately give them the funding through which they can start their own business. So that's been a really big project, um, something that I'm hoping to continue with for life really and something that I'm definitely hoping to spend um, much more time with after graduation. And Kristen was awarded the Davis um, Project for Peace Award for that project which is you know very significant. Yes, and was also very helpful. Um, Penn has been very helpful in terms of getting funding for um, a lot of these things. So the Davis Project for Peace was definitely extremely helpful this summer, um, and I'm very grateful. Okay, Dwayne. Yeah, so the first year of law school doesn't lend itself too well to extracurricular <laughs> activities. <laughs> um, but I was involved with Lambda Law, and now I'm the president of Lambda this year. Um, and it's been a really great experience. We have a wonderful board. Uh, and we're also just going to what I think you introduced saying is that if you, there isn't something on campus, then there's so many opportunities to start it. And I'm actually involved with starting a civil rights law project at the law school. Um, and that's using my internship with the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission this summer. Uh, we're having a partnership with them. Um, and since Pennsylvania doesn't have statewide protections for sexual orientation or gender identity, um, one of my main roles with the project is to gain relationships with the Philadelphia Commission and the Mazzoni Center who do uh, discrimination cases based on sexual orientation and gender identity. So, Okay, Dwayne, I know it's not a, 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 an extracurricular activity at this time, but can you talk a little bit about um, deferring law school and teaching in North Philadelphia to schools um, in North Philadelphia. Talk about those two years, what that was like for you. Sure. Um, so, so I deferred law school to do Teach for America. And um, so I, I taught in North Philadelphia for two years. And while you're doing Teach for America, you have to get your certification. And Teach for America in Philadelphia has a partnership with the Graduate School of Education. So that's where um, I did my certification courses. Um, and you know, I always, so the teaching experience was obviously really challenging. Uh, Teach for America places in schools that you know, have at least a 90% poverty rate. Um, and so, you know, at the time I was wondering, what am I doing? I know I'm going to law school, why am I doing Teach for America? Um, but, and, but now, you know, I really, I wouldn't trade the experience in for the world. I still have students who email me. Uh, and send me messages, and that's just, I mean, that's golden. I actually had, I celebrated my five-year anniversary with my partner on Thursday, and one of my face, one of my students, former students, posted on my Facebook wall and said, congrats, Mr. Bensing, hope you have a thousand more years, or something like that. It was the sweetest thing ever. <laughs> um, so, 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 yeah, and I, I always think that, that was really great for my partner and I, because um, I feel like some law students, when they come to Philadelphia, um, the law school, can kind of shrink in on them, but because I did Teach for America in North Philly and we live in Northern Liberties, we really got to incorporate not only Penn into our lives, but also Philadelphia, and it's been, it's been home. Thanks, Twain. Okay, next question. Two-part question, and I prepared you for this, so. <laughs> I want you to talk about uh, the, the theme of this panel is Penn students today, you know, being successful, achieving success and excellence. So, first part of the question is, um, what have you done personally to be successful at Penn? And then the second part, um, how have others, and you can talk about individuals if you like, um, helped you succeed at Penn? So that could be uh, faculty, staff, other students, you know, some of the groups that we've talked about. So, Saurabh, I'm gonna pick on you first. Okay, that's a hefty question. Uh, so I guess the first, uh, the, the, real, the real 
keystone of where I've gone through Penn uh, was networking with faculty members uh, and finding the right faculty members. Uh, and it's not so easy uh, because there's a lot of faculty. It's not clear who is in the correct field or the correct who, who actually has an interest in what you're doing or want to do. Uh, and there's always a variance in how much a faculty member wants to get involved with a new student, uh, especially coming in as a first year. Uh, but I found the Civic Scholars Program to be an excellent starting point, and I used that as a, as a roadmap to, I guess, higher level faculty, people who had been with Penn for a long time. And so I found, and as well with the University Scholars, uh, I, I was able to link in with some of my other interests almost automatically. Um, but since then, I've, I've spent a lot of time uh, aligning myself with all the different research groups on campus, uh, faculty research groups that are related to the fields that I'm interested in. Um, and so I guess that the biggest thing, besides having a smartphone um, for success <laughs> at Penn, uh, has, been, has been networking with the correct faculty and spending a lot of time with just managing those relationships uh, and finding the right people and vetting people that I, I didn't think I would be able to get along with in the long term in terms of our research. Um, and I guess it, it's a two-way street. So for the second part of the question, some of my faculty mentors have been invaluable in everything I've done. Um, for example, my Guatemala project has been a real big part of my pen experience. Uh, I, I got to Guatemala because I went to my mentor in the emergency medicine, Department of Emergency Medicine. I didn't mention that research project, but that's on cardiac arrest in Philadelphia. Uh, and I told him, I just gave him a list of things I wanted to do. I said, I want to be in an, a foreign country because I had some experience working in India during high school. Uh, I said, I wanted to leverage my fire and EMS skills, uh, and I wanted to do some sort of research project, and I wanted to count for classes as well. Um, and the next day, he sent me an email uh, with the right person, uh, CC'd, and said, this person can make it happen. Uh, and so about a week later, I was in Guatemala. It was a week before spring break. Uh, and so it just happened, and it worked, and it, it was just, it, it, I couldn't have gone smoother. Uh, and then on the other end of it, Penn has been really generous with funding, so through my relationship with university scholars and civic scholars, as well as LSM, um, I've barely had to lift a finger to be able to have my research projects funded. Uh, and that's been, I mean, nothing I've done at Penn could have been possible without that kind of generosity. So I, I think that two-way street of just networking with the right people. Uh, you, I just want to mention, he touched on something um, that I think is unique to Penn, and that is uh, the ability or the opportunity for undergrads to do research. And I think many of our panelists have done. If you look at Sorov's resume, I mean, he's done all kinds of research in uh, you know, gunshot um, victims and cardiac arrest and HIV and all kinds of things. And I think that's unique to Penn. So I just wanted to mention that. Kristen. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess, actually, I think I think uh, my parents were less valuable in that, in, in giving me that skill. I think that was just uh, a result of doing a pre-orientation program. Uh, yeah. So I did the Penn Core pre-orientation program, uh, and that sort of established my first network at Penn. Um, I, I guess this is something that everyone hates or talks about as if it's a bad thing, but Penn is all about networks. I think, um, and. PenCore was my first network of people. I, we, we went into Philadelphia. We worked in different places uh, over that weekend. Uh, and I, we were able, as all the students in that program, were able to establish a relationship with the faculty involved in the program. Uh, and that was sort of where I learned that the faculty actually cared at Penn and that I could leverage my relationships with them. Uh, it wasn't so much any experience before that. That said, my experience running a nonprofit in high school 
gave me some of the, the skills in relationship management and you know, finding out how to communicate with people higher up in the university. Uh, but for a student that isn't, isn't so involved, I think the pre-orientation programs are one big segment. And right, mm -hmm. right before school starts, before NSO. Mm -hmm. um, and the second part is for students interested in research. I'm involved with uh, CURVE's research <coughs> advisory program. Uh, and so students that are interested in research, I think uh, you know, the University Scholars Program is extremely beneficial in linking students in, with interest in certain fields with seniors and juniors who are involved in similar research projects. Uh, and so that guidance it was extremely valuable uh, because people who had already navigated the system could tell me how to go about doing it. And unfortunately, Civic Scholars hasn't done the same because it's a new program, so there hasn't been that. Mm -hmm. we're, we're the first year, so there wasn't that standing base of students ahead of us. Um, but University Scholars certainly was. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Kristen. Um, okay, so yeah, I, um, I came from a family. Um, my parents didn't go to college, so I was like, oh wow, this is a big place. Um, <laughs> Um, and I don't think I did anything, I think part of it that I brought to it is that I'm a naturally inquisitive person, I'm a naturally very driven person, I'm always seeking opportunity. Um, but I think also being part of the Huntsman program, having a great advisor there, Inga, um, she has linked me up with so many opportunities, she has seen, you know, promise in me, She's, she listens to what I say and she can think of the next thing that I should be doing um, to realize whatever um, goal it is. I'm also involved with the University Scholars, so that was, again, freshman year. Um, connects you immediately with a faculty member, connects you immediately um, with research ex experience. Uh, I think in terms of being a successful student, um, for me it's always just been about finding the right balance, um, especially being within the, you know, the two schools, the college and Warren, getting you know, five or six classes a semester that really represent a variety of different topics. I found that when I do classes purely in one school, or if I do sort of four finance classes a semester, that for me that's just not intellectually stimulating. So I have to be doing, like right now I'm taking a Russian literature class, I'm taking a math class, I'm taking one finance class. So I have to take a variety of classes. Um, and in terms of people here who have helped me. I think Penn does a very good job that when you approach a professor with an idea, they're very willing to invest in you. Um, I've just gone through a long fellowship application process and it was amazing how many of the professors were just excited to write for me and wanted to see me succeed. Um, and really said that, they, like some of them actually said to me, you know, this is what we look forward to. And I think having people like that who truly believe in you and you know, even when you're a little bit insecure, who can give you that extra push, whether it be professors, or um, for me, it's been a, largely professors, um, but even my advisor, I think that has also really guided a lot of my Penn experience as well. Okay, Dwayne. Sure, uh, you know, I think so much of it is just being open to the opportunities that are out there. Um, and it's funny, I'm thinking right now, and then a lot of us are applying for jobs and we're thinking about that. And I can connect almost every job right now to uh, about two and a half years ago when I met Bob Schoenberg <laughs> and at the 25th anniversary, he, you know, this man walks up and says, hello, I'm Bob Schoenberg. Like, Who's this gregarious fellow? Um, but I'm so glad he did because at that 25th anniversary, I met Steve Glassman, who was the chairman of the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. Well, what did I do last summer? I interned for the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. I would not have known about that opportunity had I not met Steve. Um, Bob also introduced me to, uh, to, to other folks uh, who had been donors to the LGBT Center, and they've become wonderful mentors, my partner and myself, and through them, um, I met folks who are Penn alums who live in Washington, D.C. So when I had an interview for a firm in Washington, D.C., who did I stay with? Well, these Penn alums who I met because Bob introduced me to friends who had friends in Washington, D.C. And when I go back to Washington, D.C. next weekend um, for, you know, kind of a callback interview kind of thing, I'm staying with another Penn alum who Bob introduced me to um, at a Pen in the Pines event a few weeks ago who is, a, is another donor of the LGBT Center. So it's just being open to those opportunities and, and it's so great to see so many alums here and for this event because you're such a resource for students and right now is a scary time uh, to be entering, entering this job market so just having the Pen connection and these diversity group connections is so important um, for us to please just keep doing it because it means everything for, for us when we're starting our lives.
Thanks, Dwayne. And thanks, Bob. Kalina. So I think going off of what everyone else said, um, I came from a very small high school. So I was, my graduating class was 71. Um, so very small, and I'm from the Bronx, so 71 is like the amount of people that live on my floor. Um, <laughs> um, so because of that, I was used to the individualized attention um, in terms of navigating what you're going to do with your life, navigating all the resources that are available to you. Um, I'm also in the Albert G. Oliver program. I don't know if people have heard of that, but it's similar to Prep for Prep and ABC. Basically, um, it recruits minority students in seventh grade who are doing um, fairly well in middle school and then exposes them to the whole independent school realm, whether it be day school or boarding school. And the great thing about this program, it's had a great relationship with Penn. In my graduating class from the Oliver program, we were a group of about 13 students and six of us went to Penn. So like the Oliver program and Penn are like really, we're tight. Um, so being in that program, I think they helped me navigate Penn because of their long lasting relationships with Penn and because of the alum that either work at Penn, teach at Penn, or still involved in Penn and were Oliver Scholars, I came here with um, a much clearer sense of what's available to me. Also, I did apply early decisions, so I did do a lot of research to make sure that this is where I wanted to come. So I already knew coming into this. And then going off of the pre-orientation programs, I did the Africana Studies program, and I did PennQuest. <laughs> Has anyone done PenQuest? You guys know that? So PenQuest is a hiking program. <laughs> and we literally went to like the Poconos and hiked 15 miles in three days and that was it. And it was awesome. Um, so I got to meet a lot, like a lot of different people through these two programs. And as everyone else has said, my advisor is like a blessing. Um, I, I can say something as simple as, yeah, there's that class that talks about politics and communication. Oh, Communication 296, taught by Professor Jameson. Like, she knows everything. And she knows everyone. And she knows Weingarten. Weingarten is a huge reason um, behind my success at Penn. There's do you want to, so do you want to talk about what that is, the Learning Center? Yeah, Weingarten Learning Center um, and Resource Center. It helps with study skills, it helps with time management skills, all those kinds of just extra little pushes and it holds me accountable, which I know helps me get work done um, because I know my advisor at Weingarten who's taking the time out to help me with all this is expecting to see some results when I bring her my paper and we can discuss it. So Weingarten is fantastic, once again, would have not heard of that without my advisor. So it really, it's really about networking and knowing the right people because my advisor, I have had her since freshman year. I have a major advisor now who's fabulous, but I still see my advisor every single week just because she's that helpful um, and she knows me. So I think she, I won't say she's the reason why, why I'm successful, but she's definitely a huge, huge reason um, in utilizing my resources and finding the right people who can send me in the right direction. So. Okay, Brandon. You know, I, I, I feel like I'm in a little bit of a precarious situation here because um, I, I, I'm, I don't know, I, I, I tend to, um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a socialite. I, I, I love to, you know, um, you know be around people and, and be with friends and stuff like that. And, um, you know, so that, that, I, that to me is, is the, the most major thing that, that, that's happened to me. You know, I've met so many different people um, here at Penn, uh, it's such a diverse culture there, I and mean, you can meet anybody from all around the world, and and you know you just get different perspectives on uh, on on anything. And I, I think, uh, especially live, you know, we all have to live in the college houses our, our freshman year, and uh, you know, being exposed to a floor, I, I had you know 15 other people on my floor who are just come from every you know different space on the planet, and uh, you know the, those guys. You know, I still talk to him today, and and we, we have a support system. You know what I mean? It's it we help each other out anytime we need anything. You know, if it's a study partner or a place to a place to go just to get away. You know, I, I live with six other guys, so our house tends to get very hectic. And you know, if I need a spot to to go, I, I have a great support group to to keep me up. And I I really think that's basically been the main reason of my success at Penn, definitely. You know, I'm glad um, Brandon brought that up because I think one of the um, 
maybe misperceptions out there is that Penn is ultra competitive and that the students um, might not always support each other. Um, Brandon mentioned, is there any of, uh, of you other panelists want to say a few words about your friends and your, I mean. I, I kind of actually want to continue with that point a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah, I mean, sure. Especially, you know, you get this culture in Wharton that, you know, especially because everything is graded on the curve that people mm -hmm. don't want to share notes or people, I mean, at least it's what you hear. I, you know, if, if, if any of you have read that book about Wharton to Wall Street, I mean, you know, at, at times you, you see things, I mean, you, you definitely have people that, you know, are, are like that and, and are very, you know, focused on their goals and, and things like that. But, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's, you know, as, as much as you make it that, you know, I, I, I've never been in a situation where I felt uncomfortable, you know, helping others succeed. Why, why, why would I want to make them not successful? I mean, we all are here to succeed and, and move on and have successful lives, and that just doesn't make any sense to me. So, it's, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's true at all. Anybody else want to comment on that? Sure. Um, I mean, uh, so my, uh, I guess the the group of people I've talked about has been, I mean. So I joined a business fraternity. I didn't quite know what it was. Uh, I still don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> but what I, what I did gain from that was uh, a lot of email on a daily basis, listservs, listserv craziness, uh, which, which, you know, it can be annoying, but is also a testament to how much, how connected a certain group of people can be. And I know a lot of us are either in fraternities or sororities. And so that, that kind of network, I think, is also valuable at Penn. Um, uh, and, and some of my best mentors have been students older than myself uh, who have graduated or are in the, or, well now me, graduating and the students below me uh, who have guided me through Penn. So some of my best uh, mentors now work at different companies or in medical school uh, and throughout Penn, you know, when, when they were juniors and seniors, they sort of took me into their, into their arms and, you know, I guess shielded me from all, all the things that could have gone wrong. Um, and that's been really valuable. And not so much as my, not in the same manner in which my advisor did that, but in a more personal manner, yeah, as friends, as, as people connected over common interests. Uh, and that's been really, really powerful for me. Is that you're doing it Yes, yeah. Any other comments on that? Okay, oh, go ahead, Dwayne. I, was, I think law schools are notorious for being competitive places, and that's one of the reasons we picked Penn, was because um, it's such a collegial place. Um, within the first weeks of law school, I had an outline for every single one of my courses, and, um, and we keep doing that. We, you know, now we have a mentor program for Lambda where every uh, 1L who wants one has an upperclassman who's a mentor to them. So it's a really great community for that. We, we're kind of, we agree with what you were saying earlier. We're all in the same boat. There's no reason to be competitive with each other, so, yeah. Okay. I want to shift the focus a little bit. Um, financial aid, as Dr. Gutman mentioned in her remarks this morning, is uh, a priority for Penn, both at the graduate and professional school level and the undergraduate level. Uh, the, the, both the dollar amount and the percentage of students who are receiving financial aid has gone up. Um, there's a no loan package for, for people who get into Penn. So I want to ask the panelists um, to comment on how financial aid has impacted both your decision to attend Penn, um, what it's meant for you as you've been able to study here. And that includes uh, research um, dollars and, and stipends and things like that. So I'm going to open it up and you know, let you talk about that. Um, do you guys mind if I go first? Go I, I feel very impacted by financial I mean, basically, if I didn't have financial aid, there's no way I could go here, period. Like, uh, I'm, I'm similar to Chris and my, you know, I'm a first generation college student. Uh, you know, my parents are basically, my, my mom's a housewife, my dad's a landscaper, so, you know, we're not bringing in any type of great money or anything, and, and with, without financial aid, it's, it's as simple as I wouldn't be able to go here, and um, it's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, people are donating money for, for me to get an education. It's like, it's mind-blowing, and I, I feel thankful every day that, that, that people are doing that. I mean, my life would be completely different. I don't even know what I would be doing right now without financial aid. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So, Brandon, did you decide to come to Penn because of the financial aid? Um, well, when I, I knew that if I didn't get financial aid that I wouldn't be coming to Penn. That, that, let's put it that way. I mean, I, I, I've heard that, you know, the Ivy League is very good about um, 
you know, financial aid packages and specifically Penn. So, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was thinking that they were going to take care of me and they did. I mean, I, to this day, I've taken out like a thousand dollars in a loan. That's it. And so I'm going to graduate with a thousand dollars in debt, which is considering that my, our education cost over $200,000 is just incredible. It's, it's really that, it's incredible. I definitely um, echo what Brandon said. Um, I'm, once again, would not even be looking in the direction of Philadelphia <laughs> without financial aid. Um, and I actually took, I got a little overwhelmed by college at first, so I actually took a semester off in the fall of 2008. Um, I would be graduating with all these lovely people, but unfortunately I'm not, but it's okay. Um, and so I was really worried about my transition back to school after taking a semester off, um, especially in terms of the financial aid package, because as we all know, financial aid is distributed much earlier in the summer. And here I am applying to go back to school in January, because um, I took that entire fall semester off. And it ended up being completely successful. Um, I had no issues with the financial aid department whatsoever. I had a great room um, once I came back. I wasn't kind of just shoved into whatever place had space. Um, I am diabetic, so because of that, I need a fridge to keep my insulin in. Like, I need certain things. Um, and Penn completely kept that in mind, put me in <coughs> one of the high rises, and covered it, period. So the financial aid office is been extremely generous. Um, it's great because, you know, they're really making an investment in us. You know, like they wouldn't be giving us this kind of money if they didn't think that we're gonna, if that we won't go out into the world and change it, essentially. So that kind of passion and trust and understanding for where we're coming from and what we need to do well, and their understanding that that's what we need is just a beautiful relationship. Um, I've never had an issue with any kind of financial aid here, and I definitely feel blessed. So, thank you. Any other comments? I'll just say two things. I, <coughs> on the coming here part, you know, for my partner and I, we felt like it was buy one get one free. <laughs> um, so that was nice. Um, and then, but what's really what was really. Um, great for us and when we were making our decision is, is that I was really focused on doing public interest work after graduation. Um, and I think I'll probably still do that, but maybe not immediately after. Um, but for, student, for law students who want to do that, there's so much support for them to get public interest loans, that loan forgiveness program at the law school is just phenomenal. And it was one of the main reasons um, you know, that Penn was so attractive uh, in the first place was that this loan program compared to other law students' forgiveness for uh, law students who do public interest work um, is just a cut above the rest. And so that's a really phenomenal program that I wanted to share. To add a different flavor to funding, I guess. I don't receive any financial aid, but I have, you know, by the time I graduate, I'll have upwards of, you know, twenty to thirty thousand dollars in research funding, which came without grants, without anything, just a question for money and uh, a check, uh, which has been. I, I couldn't have done any of the research that I've done at Penn without that kind of funding, uh, and th that funding has come from a, new, uh, a variety of sources, uh, which I mentioned before, but. Uh, I wouldn't be involved in research if I couldn't fund any of the work I've done. Some of it has involved extensive travel, uh, you know, purchasing software, which costs more than, you know, a car or whatever else. Um, and, and so uh, that's, that's just completely changed my experience at Penn. Yeah, I would also say um, in terms of financial aid, I received financial aid, but I came in with a lot of merit-based scholarships, so that took away from my financial aid package, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but Penn has um, really contributed towards anything that I've done in terms of research or community service. Um, and I've done so many trips abroad. Um, you know, in the last three years, I've been to three different continents. So, you know, I didn't pay for any of those trips. Um, a lot of, you know, I went through the Penn and Botswana program, I went through U Scholars, I went through the Abroad Office, uh, I went through the Huntsman program. So really what I've learned is if you, you know, have something that you want to do, as long as you're willing to ask a couple of people, generally they'll make it happen for you. So Penn has been really great about that. And if I could add just one more point. Sure. Uh, so one of the challenges that, uh, at least I guess in Wharton, that we face is, uh, I guess, the, the, the common motivation to to get summer internships 
Uh, and so when, when our peers are making tons of money over the summer, you have to think about what the incentive is for you to go do research or volunteer work abroad during the summers. Uh, but the funding has made that transition possible because I make, in the summers, I, I, I have approximately the same amount of funding a student who works at an iBank 100 hours a week can gain in that summer. And I, I know at the end of the summer, I've, I've spent that money in, in a way that's benefited a community uh, that, that has generated some research that will both benefit myself as well as society, hopefully. Uh, and so that, that opportunity, I think, is a tremendous way to uh, realign motivations and incentives. Okay. Um, oh, yes. I know, for one thing, some of my best friends wouldn't be here if they didn't have their financial aid packages. Um, I, I mean, it's a simple statement. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I really wish, I really wish I could say more than that. But yeah. it, it's literally as simple as that. Um, you, you know, one, one thing that, and you know, maybe this is going a little away from your question, but um, when. So I, I was, you know, I, I went to a high school of, there was 500 people in my graduating class. Um, so we had a, you know, a pretty decent sized school. And uh, every single one of the, you know, I wasn't even at the top of my, I was in the top 15 in my class, but every single person in front of me, you know, decided to go to the University of Florida. And, you know, they have some really great things there about uh, wanting to keep students in state and, and foster that type of, that type of environment. But, um, you know, I think one thing that, that high school students need to realize is that, you know, opportunities are available like this. You know, um, it, I, I would have never thought to have, that an Ivy League school would have, been, would have been an affordable option in any sense. But, you know, with a little bit more information, and, and I know Penn is, at least for Native Americans, I'm Native American, I'm Apache and Choctaw. Um, you know, they, they've, they've hired a Native American specific person in the mm -hmm. graduate office, um, you know, in order to go around the country and tell these people that, that options are available like this. And they want students to come here. You know, we only, this past year, we accepted 46 Native American students out of 2,500, which is an increase. It's really great, but it's still less than 1%. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's crazy. But, you know, I, I feel like Penn is doing everything they can to get, to get more diverse people here, and, and, and all we can do is applaud them. Jackie, you have a question? Yes, uh, a question to follow up on your question. Not only does the financial aid incentive uh, nourishes the pen commitment for a diverse community, but in terms of the essential purpose of education is to uh, generate the next generation, if you will, of scholars <coughs> and leaders for the broader community and thank God we can do that debt free. I mean, <laughs> a lot of the disincentive of going to a school like Penn that you come out of it after graduation with a boatload of money that you got to pay back, which in many ways supports how you can also make significant community uh, contributions to your respected ethnocultural communities, uh, which is very, very important because we know that those communities where people we call minorities are uh, from are also relatively bereft with an educated class of folks who are ultimately uh, dedicated to the up, upward of those communities so that you can have more kids like you not only come to Penn, but go on to school everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I just wonder to what extent has that kind of sentiment been fostered in you as you come here for your own, and rightfully so, own individual ambitions, but how has it been, how have those um, individual ambitions been you know, it's 
to your commitment to your own people mm -hmm. so that they too can come after you. I'll talk about that real fast because I just went back to Arkansas for the first time in a while last weekend. Um, and my partner and I, we, we come from Podunk, Arkansas. And, um, <laughs> we don't really want to go back, but we do every now and then to visit our nephews. And we have two <coughs> nephews, one's three and one's one. And every time we go back, we bring something from Penn. And so our three-year-old nephew learned this last weekend the term Ivy League and I want to go to Penn. <laughs> because he's a smart boy. Um, and so, and, and my partner, I mean, his, neither of his parents even graduated high school. Uh, and his sister still lives in the, his hometown. Um, and so, it, it's just, for us, when we were making our decision about where are we going to college, the options, we didn't know about all of our options. And so I think in that way, it's kind of what you're talking about, giving back to where we come from. Um, and so now for this three-year-old, he's wondering where is Philadelphia? That was another word he learned I was talking about. So, you know, I had never heard of Philadelphia until who knows when. Um, so, so I think that's a way in which we're just broadening that horizon of where, where their world begins and ends.